Good day and welcome to the CIM's Indigenous webinar series brought to you by the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Today we will be talking with Taryn Cutler, Siobhan Dooley, Kimberly Azak and Mary Marone on the topic of Indigenous Women at Work. My name is Cassandra Spence, and on behalf of the CIM, I want to thank you for joining us today for the second in the series of webinars focused on the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the mining industry. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that I am joining the call from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam nations. There is a handout available with information on today's speakers and the webinar series, which you can access from the control panel. And I am pleased to inform you that the presentation will be recorded and will be available on the diversity and inclusion section of the CIM website in the coming weeks. So some housekeeping before we get started. If you joined with your computer audio, make sure you select the computer audio button on your control panel. And if you dialed in with a traditional phone, please select the phone call option. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box in the control panel and they will be addressed at the end of the discussion. <clears throat> now, without any further ado, please welcome our moderator for this session, Mary Marone. And Mary is a pursuit manager who specializes in leading and facilitating focus groups, including strategic sessions, presentation coaching, and workshops with a variety of stakeholders. Welcome. Cassandra, thank you so much for that introduction. Hello everyone and welcome. And today we're gonna to be exploring an ex uh, the experiences and perspectives of not only women in mining, but specifically indigenous women who have chosen to work in exploration and mining. And now our panel, we have Taryn Cutler and Taryn is the community liaison and office manager at Seabridge Goals. And she's coming to you from Smithers, British Columbia. And Taryn recently won the Women in Mining Indigenous Student Trailblazer Award. And then we have Kimberly Azak. And Kimberly is a geotechnician at Heatherdale Resources. And she's coming to you from Southeast Alaska. And Kimberly is currently training another First Nation woman in Korshak. And then we have Siobhan Dooley. And Siobhan is a controls and automation engineer at Hatch and presently working in St. John's, Newfoundland. And she's, wor she's worked on various projects and mining surface facilities. So welcome, ladies, and thank you so much for joining us today. Karen, I would like to start with you. And I think let's, let's help the viewers get to understand and know us all. So Taryn, what was working, like was working in mining industry always something you've dreamt of doing? Um, I have to say it wasn't initially on my, uh, on my radar, but having, being born in a mining town, that's where I was born. So majority of my family members all worked in mining. So um, I was very familiar with it. It was very common. They, we recognized as a family, all the opportunities that were there for mining. So it was a bit encouraged to work in the mining industry, but I didn't set out my career to, to end up in mining. It just kind of happened organically over the years. Um, I, part of my nation, the Telpen Nation, we're very um, familiar with mining. We have an operating mine in our traditional territory. We have numerous exploration projects. So it was, it was a comfortable transition for me to to take advantage of some of the, the job opportunities. So I was happy to happy to join the exploration company. So coming from a mining town, would you say then the expectation was that you would work in mining industry? Um, it was it was a bit. Um, I have to say my family more is in the trades area. So trades was kind of pushed a little bit. Um, but for me, I, I wasn't into trades. I was more into the hands on and working one on one with people and supporting in some some initiatives. So for me, going into the area of community liaison was kind of, it was a good fit for me because I like working with, with people and I like promoting the opportunities of mining. And so it was a comfortable, comfortable opportunity for me. Wonderful. And let's go to Kimberly. Kimberly, what was working, like was working in mining something always something you thought you'd be doing? Um, so about 10 years ago, I 
um, participated in a women introductory to women in mining. Um, and from there, um, I've always loved outdoors. I always loved rocks, uh, collecting rocks. Um, so it was pretty much something that I felt comfortable. And so when I got into this job, I thought, you know, it was a great opportunity to be um, exploring the land and um, yeah. All right, thank you. And Siobhan, what about what motivated you to work in mining industry? Yeah, so I actually grew up in uh, northwestern Ontario, and uh, the, the town that I grew up in didn't have any um, mining uh, jobs or anything like that um, in the actual uh, town itself. So I didn't really grow up knowing too much about mining, and it wasn't really until um, I got my job with Hatch and I started working in the Sudbury office that I started learning a little bit more about mining um, the facilities, the surface facilities, the underground operations, uh, that type of stuff. So uh, it was about 2015 that I started getting uh, quite curious and my interest was piqued with uh, underground mining and I really wanted to get involved with a capital project. So I, um, I joined the uh, Boise's Bay Mine Expansion Project in St. John's and uh, so I moved out to Newfoundland at the end of 2016 and I uh, started working at that site in 2018. So maybe so the viewers can get a better understanding of what you do in mining, tell us what, what a, your one day of a job would look like. So yeah, it looks a little bit um, different depending on uh, like what project I'm on, uh, but uh, at the beginning when I was uh, in, in the project office, I was doing um, more like kind of like admin stuff with the uh, uh, package development uh, for the uh, packages on that that's going to be delivering the IT uh, systems on site and then um, when I went up to site in 2018 I was uh, in charge of implementing a, a development operational management system uh, so that allowed me to work one-on-one -on -one with uh, the miners and the uh, shift bosses and I got to learn about the development cycle and they really took me under their wing and showed me um, kind of what the cycles look like and um, learning from them exactly like what type of challenges that they face to try to uh, kind of get, tweak the system that we were implementing uh, so that it worked uh, a lot better for the adoption. Very good. And Kimberly, what does a day in mining look like for you? Um, so a day in mining for me, um, you know, we're on 12 hour shifts. so starting early in the morning, ending in the evening, um, moving core, looking at rocks, seeing what kind of minerals are in the rocks, you know, going through a lot of the daily tasks. Um, yeah, it's pretty um, interesting to go through um, what the days, because sometimes the days are busy and sometimes they're fast paced. Um, sometimes they get to go underground. Um, so. A lot of different opportunity um, just being able to go from one area to the other um, and uh, yeah interesting Great. stuff and and Karen I understand you do something a little different with Seabridge so can you share a little bit about what that might be yeah so as my role as community liaison um, I, I coordinate and, and assist with development of all of our social media to our handouts our info sheets on all of our projects. Seabridge has five exploration projects in North America. So I'm in charge of basically promoting the projects and exploration to communities. So kind of the face of a lot of our activities that we're doing. It's important for Seabridge to be a welcome member of communities. So and being transparent as much as possible. So I'm fortunate to work with a company that that likes input. So I, I handle the day to days comments from people to working in normal times, traveling to all of the communities in which we operate in, participating in community events to career fairs. So it's a bit of a different different role, but very hands-on, which I like. And I understand that you also have experience in negotiations. So what are some of the positive experiences or, or some of the progress that you've seen towards equality? Yeah, um, with Seabridge, I was able to be part of, from the start, took seven years to process through the environmental assessment and for one of our projects and coordinated and supported my staff doing the impact benefits agreements with two of the indigenous groups that we work with 
we have five indigenous groups we work with so myself being part of one of those groups was very interesting and an interesting learning experience for sure um i i do appreciate the impact benefits agreements because it's a nation that that makes those decisions and i think that's important that everyone has a voice and everyone has input on these projects because they are impactful and every nation is different and every nation needs a, has a voice and should have a voice for these projects. Um, Siobhan, in the past, I know Indigenous women were often excluded from negotiation, negotiations such as impact benefit uh, agreements. Is that still the case? Yes, yeah, so I don't have a, like, a whole lot of uh, experience with impact uh, benefit agreements, but um, just from what I've learned uh, being in the mining industry in the last uh, about six years or so, um, with like actual underground mining, um, I think that you know bringing um, indigenous women to the table will provide different viewpoints and um, uh, ideas and stuff like that to the table. Uh, just because one thing that like you know maybe might not be considered is the fact that a lot of mining operations occur in uh, remote areas, which would require uh, you know a, a rotational work. So. Uh, for example, where I work, uh, I work on a two and two. So I work two weeks on site, two weeks off site. And while I'm on site, um, I am doing 12 hour days. And, uh, you know, the internet can be um, not so great. So you're not really able to FaceTime your families. And so you're, uh, you know, you're away from your family from for that amount of time. So bringing those types of experiences to the tables of IBA um, negotiations and co consultation, uh, you know, you're, you're, bringing those, th those values uh, to that table. And, you know, it's something that might not have been maybe considered, uh, you know, 20 years ago when some of the IBAs uh, in the area that I work in were put in place. But um, I think it just brings a more well-rounded discussion to the table. So then what are some of the positive experiences that you've had that you, for the respecting the rights and the ex uh, aspirations of Indigenous people? Yeah, so at uh, Boise's Bay, they, uh, um, for, as part of the general orientation, they have a cultural awareness uh, training session that, uh, uh, so it's uh, it's put on by uh, workers at the site who are part of the Inu and the Inuit nations in the in that area, and uh, they provide uh, it's about 30 to 45 minutes about um, the the different communities in the area what the differences are between the Inu and the Inuit. And um, it's something that uh, even like I noticed uh, while since I've been on site for the past two and a half years, uh, people exiting that uh, training session and, you know, being kind of like, wow, I didn't know anything about like the area here. I didn't understand, I didn't realize like that the groups were so different and, you know, what their core beliefs are a little bit different and how they approach, uh, you know, uh, viewing the land and the sea and that type of stuff. So um, I think that's been like something that was really positive uh, that I, I've noticed at least. And then also, um, you know, if, I think if our, our like the hatch, they put on uh, like training modules about Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, but I think it's also important that, you know, uh, doing regional specific ones when there's an actual project going on in that area that they, that, uh, you know, the companies are putting on uh, informational sessions about the, that geographic region. Uh, Karen, over to you. What, what have you found different with the IBAs from before and now? Um, I think the difference is that it's, it's more of a collective approach. Um, I've seen Indigenous groups come together when there's um, sometimes positive and negatives that are happening or, or there's there's activities happening so a resource company bringing activities and and more of a highlight on the their territory so i think with that brings more people together so i think and then more decisions can be made or people are looking at it from a different perspective and i think collectively it, it brings a voice out and so i think that's a positive thing that people are wait we need to pay attention to this and i think that's a good thing and and working with industries more and Often there's a, I think a negative stereotype that comes with some mining or there's a bad experience historically, might not have been as good. So I think when you bring more attention to some, some resources and then people talk about it more, I think that's where the, where the value is. So sharing that info. Right, and uh, Kimberly, uh, this question to you, what are some of the opportunities that support indigenous people's engagement? Um, 
Well, I work with a team that kind of um, supports um, a lot of the initiatives by respecting um, the traditional territories. They um, input, they ask for input on, you know, how they can incorporate that in their business. Um, you know, looking at different ways of how, um, for me individually, being able to share a lot of, um, you know, because I'm Nishka, a lot of core values that I bring to the table for um, just for them understanding, they're very understanding, they give a lot of opportunities, whether it's training or something that I'm interested in. So um, having a supportive team, I think really makes a difference between um, when you know, uh, we're looking at the support systems that are around in the companies, I think is really important. And so I think that's um, one of the advantages. Very good. Uh, then Siobhan, do you, do you see anything different with the opportunities to support Indigenous people's engagement? Uh, so, sorry, could you repeat that again? Do you, do you see anything different with the opportunities that support Indigenous people's engagement? I don't think that there's anything really different. Um, I think that, uh, especially with, uh, you know, in certain areas where these, uh, you know, operations are located, uh, they may need to, you know, um, approach uh, certain um, maybe initiatives a little bit differently and also just around the fa whole fact that you know that maybe there's their the remote communities so you know having to send someone directly to the community rather than bringing them to the site uh you know so stuff like that that might need to be considered when um trying to engage the local communities for opportunities on uh, on the sites very good um then, Siobhan, would you say that for, formal agreements ensure economic opportunities are equally shared between Indigenous women and men? Yeah, I would say that they like they, they are, unless, I mean, you, you have like the instances where uh, maybe like in a matriarchal uh, side of like part of the family where the woman is the like, you know, the leader of the household and um, may not want to like leave uh, the family for longer than like a week at a time and then maybe just trying to figure out those types of like those avenues to figure out how to um, make the, a rotational uh, site work for those types of individuals as well but and then in saying that though like you know it's not just between just indigenous men and women it's between like there's a, it's a it's a male dominated field mining it so the uh, a lot of the um, like, I mean, like it wasn't until the late '70s that women were even allowed to be underground in mines, and so like I work with uh, you know people that are one to two generations away from working with people that you know had the idea that you know be, uh, being having a woman underground was bad luck, and it was and, you know miners are a little bit superstitious in general, but you know you still have that kind of um, that type of mentality a little bit, but uh, I think it's definitely gotten a lot better and just even from conversations that I've had uh, from like miners on site uh, of like how things were in the 90s versus how they are now like it's, it's very different and uh, but yeah so like they are a bit of a superstitious bunch though. Can you share one of the superstitions that you were experiencing? Yeah so I was actually underground um, and I was with one of the jumbo operators uh, and you know I was when I was the teaching them how to use the smartphones and uh um oh, one of our cat plants started to blink which meant that it was going to be dying and he looked at me and he's like is that is that yours or mine and i was like and I, we checked to see like which one it was and it was his and he's like oh no <laughs> like what do you mean oh no he said that means that your wife is cheating on you I was like, oh okay. no <laughs> <laughs> well thanks for sharing that superstition with us <laughs> Um, Kimberly, being newer to the industry, where do you see some of the improvements with uh, women in mining? Um, just more or less, like I said, um, just giving opportunities that, you know, normally aren't there. Um, like I've worked with a team that supports anything that I do. Like I've worked with a miner, um, did a whole bunch of things. Um, so just more or less uh, having that um, support system that really wants to see women thrive and, 
you know, go forward in taking on roles that, you know, allow us to have uh, an equal part into the job. And, and I think, like I said, the, the, the people that I work with, they're very supportive when it comes to um, including and, you know, it's just um, great to have a team that just constantly wants to see you succeed. Very good. And and Taryn, what are some of the advantages of being a visible Indigenous women in mining? Uh, I think I think kind of the opposite a little bit of I think being visible and Indigenous and a woman. I think it just gives you more opportunity to prove them wrong and maybe nail those stereotypes of people who underestimate you or think, why did you get this job or do you know what you're doing? And so I've had a few of those negative comments of how did how did you get here or what's why is there women working here? Um, so exactly like what Sean said, it's such a male dominated industry. So um, the opportunities for me have been just kind of shattering some of those low expectations sometimes. Um, I'm, I'm also as well, like Kim really said, I have a really supportive team. I'm fortunate to be working with a per, bit of a progressive exploration company. We are 41% women for our company. Um, we have a, a great female driving force here and they make great role models and support and our and our team too supports these types of diversities and and uh yeah I, I like proving people wrong a little bit and yeah well what have you what have you seen and what have you faced for challenges being an indigenous women in mining mm -hmm. um there's been a few negative comments um just i think they underestimated like when i'm at say career fairs or trade shows people ask like how did you get here or we're, we're, who's running the show here? Where's the Where's the men? Um, had someone asked me that at one trade show, they're like, they let women here, you know, just just surprised or, or the negative of the the oh you just got this because you're indigenous or how did you get this job or so some some negative things I've had like that. Um, I like to counteract all those comments of oh what do you think or what, what do you think requires this type of role or. Um, I like to ask the questions head on and, and address those. So it's not also been yeah, personal and but again I like to and again having a supportive team where a team backs each other up of like, well, we hire hired qualified people. It doesn't matter where they come from, we base experience and and um, your your skill or your work ethic too. I think for indigenous women, I think for myself, I, I sometimes push myself extra hard because I want to be at the, the same level and consider the, the same as everyone else. And that can be challenging. So, so you proved them wrong. Yeah, try to. Very good. Uh, you know what? I'm going to ask the same question to you, Siobhan. Have you had any experiences that you'd like to share with us? <clears throat> any challenges yeah. at being an Indigenous woman in mining? Yeah, like I'll I'll start with um, maybe at the very beginning of my career when I was first starting out. Um, when I was uh, about to join Hatch, uh, one of my classmates at school. Uh, is asking me where I was going to be working and I said I got a job with Hatch and I was really excited and she immediately said oh well they only hired you because you're native and I, and at the time I was very um, I was still pretty shy and I didn't really know how to respond to that and I just kind of looked around and then I just left the conversation because I didn't know what else to do but it took me uh, anywhere between four and five years to finally feel like the job that I was doing was actually good enough and that I wasn't just um, doing, I wasn't just doing the job that I'm doing because of my background. And it was because of the work that I put in, um, the relationships that I, you know, built with clients and, you know, the, like all that hard work that I was putting in didn't seem like it was good enough to me at the time. And it really wasn't until I started, you know, get, gain more confidence and, it, you know, finally being like no wait a minute like I am good enough for this and I can do this and you know I was really scared to like go into mining and uh and I think that might have had something to do with that and then like echoing what like Taryn was saying like you do still get like you know little comments here and there and sometimes I even hear like through like you know secondhand sources of like people maybe not saying um you know politically correct things and um or in, and sometimes like it's happened like it to, like to me in a in a meeting and i've actually had to you know step step aside with them after the meeting and said that's not okay you have to you know you know readjust uh, the way that you're phrasing certain things and that was to like one of like a like a project manager type type of role and i was 
I was really scared to like actually directly talk to him, but um, I'm really glad that I did because he was actually pretty receptive and was like, I'm really sorry, like I didn't realize. And I think, you know, it's it, being a visible um, indigenous woman uh, in mining, it really gives that opportunity to uh, stop and correct certain behaviors that may, may go unchecked. And, and raise awareness, right? I think that's part of it. Um, Kimberly, over to you, same thing. Have you faced any challenges? being an Indigenous woman in mining? Um, yeah, I get the odd comments here and there about like, especially with um, being a part of the geology team, um, you know, I did not go to school for it. So they're a little bit surprised when I kind of just tell them like, you know, I just started working and got trained on a job. And, you know, a lot of the comments come from, um, you know, just, in general, just, you know, lack of um, understanding or not knowing that, you know, if you're given a opportunity, you take it. And I was given an opportunity and, you know, my work ethic kind of just carried me through. And so I kind of, for me, see the hope that, you know, more Indigenous women will continue to do and take on these leadership roles because um, it's important um, for us to show our daughters and show, you know, our children that, you know, it's an important part of what we do. And if we love what we do, then, you know, just the opportunity will always be there and present itself. And that's where I'm at right now. Like, uh, I usually um, will educate if somebody has make a, makes comments about me being Native or this and that. Um, uh, and it's just a lack of, uh, like I said, awareness, bringing awareness that, you know, um, that's what we bring to the table. So. so, Karen, let's go over to you and maybe you can tell us about some advantages of being a visible Indigenous woman in, in mining. Yeah, um, some advantages, I think, like exactly what Kimberly said, being the role model. I know myself, I've struggled a bit of oh on this okay I guess I'm a role model but I'm just I'm just doing my job and trying to do my job really really well and sometimes I've forgotten that oh yeah you people are looking at you and and it's important so I've tried to recognize that more and more exactly what Kimberly said of yeah we need to have more women involved and so I think it's important that we speak up more I'm trying to myself speak up more because I realize there needs to be more women speaking more and, and sharing your comments exactly what Shalon said like those hard comments you have sometimes you have to have them um, because you're, you're visible you, minority you have to sometimes speak up more which puts us in an awkward situation but I think women supporting women is is important so I think those advantages are there that um, we need to take them like Kimberly said very good and, and Siobhan do you have any other advantage you want to add no, just kind of, uh, you know, building upon the whole, you know, role model um, type of uh, situation that like representation really does matter. Right. And, um, you know, I'm about almost 10 years into my career now. And, um, uh, you know, and I know in about 10 years, the people entering the workforce are going to have a much different uh, experience than I, I did. And um, especially Indigenous women, there's probably, like, at least I hope, <laughs> that there's going to be more Indigenous women in this field. Um, and that, you know, they'll have um, more people to actually approach and ask for advice on how to, how to uh, you know, address certain comments that they might get or how mm -hmm. to address like, you know, a project manager that might be saying something a little insensitive and um, that, you know, like, so how, like, you know, just being able to help, you know, the younger generations that are gonna be coming through um, and, uh, you know, letting them know that, uh, you know, it can, it, it, it might not be better like to you right now, but mm -hmm. it, it, we are making strides and it, it all, all starts with like, you know, a couple of people and I think that that's what representation is all about. Then let's talk about that too. What are some of the strategies that companies and that they can do to work um, and develop and manage these challenging workplace um, situations? I think well, yeah just tying back to a lot of the education pieces like um, uh, one thing that is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine is that like 
you know, if people are saying like, oh, well, I worked with this First Nations group in, you know, Northern Alberta, but they're working in like maybe Northern Quebec. They're completely different groups of people and they have different um, needs based on their communities and the land is a lot different. And um, so I think that just making sure that companies are understanding that just because, you know, they may have experience with one group of people that it's not the same as a, like the next. And I think that like it, we are starting to get there. Um, but again, it's, it's all about education and learning about the area that is being developed and understanding those types of communities, uh, like needs and wants and, um, and, you know, just trying to figure out exactly what would be the best for that area, rather than trying to just blanket all of the Canadian First Nations and Inuit and Métis all into one little umbrella that, right. Um, right. you know, it doesn't really work that way. What about the company that you work with? And I'll probably ask this to each one of you ladies. What, 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 is, what have you seen specifically that they've done? What have they implemented? Yeah, so I can, uh, I can start off here. So uh, Hash has done like those uh, training modules online for, uh, um, for uh, the workers like across Canada. Um, and also they did like a moose hide uh, campaign and they sent that over. To, I was working actually in our client's office, not in our actual St. John's office here. And uh, they sent them over to uh, not only the uh, client office, but also up to site. And it was something that was like, um, you know, I had like coworkers coming up to me that were from the client and they were saying, oh, did you know that Hatch was doing this? I was like, yeah, because <laughs> I was actually part of like, I was like involved with some of the planning of that. And um, yeah, and I think it's like, just like getting involved with like more initiatives that uh, like outside of um, just like the company, but also like, you know, for National Indigenous Peoples Day, using that as like a, um, a way to, you know, broaden everyone's, uh, I guess, viewpoint of like why, and maybe like, uh, you know, start doing like a little bit of like regional to specific about like, so like in Saskatchewan, like learning about, uh, you know, the Cree in that area or, you know, the Ojibwe in the Sudbury area. And that is something that I've seen that Hatch has done like in the, in the past for National Indigenous Peoples Day, which is really great. Very good. Uh, Karen, how about yourself, your company? What did they done to, to raise awareness? Yeah, so for our company, I think the important part is um, being a welcome member of the communities in which we operate. So with that, I mean that we are doing everything we can to get to know the communities we are working in, because exactly what Shawan said, there's no one size fits all. What one community is, their level of understanding of, of the mining life cycle is very different from the next community. So always being conscious of where you're operating, who you're communicating with, and being conscious of that. So for, for Seabridge, we, we very much take those things very seriously. And um, um, when we go to any community event, we're taking as many people as we can so we can answer as many questions qualified as we can. Um, we try to never stumble with questions. We, we find the answers to community members because all those things are important and validate their perspectives. And it goes the same for our projects for our exploration sites. We don't have a lot of direct employees, but we have a lot of contractors. But we recognize if you're working on one of our sites, you're part of our team. So I think that's important that, that you're there, you have the, the work ethic, the meeting the objective, safety, safety is universal. A huge focus on safety. We want everyone to get home safe um, and that you're part of the team and welcomed. We've heard the comment before of some of our sites of, oh, I really like working on your projects because everyone feels like a family and everyone checks on each other. And so I think that's important that people feel comfortable in our sites. Thank you for sharing that, Taryn. Kimberly, over to you. What, what has your company done to raise awareness? Um, well, they do, um, majority of the time they hire First Nations um, community members. So they, you know, they have, I guess, identified the importance of bringing the community members onto site. And, you know, like I said, um, I am training uh, an Alaskan girl to work as a geotech and so and that was an initiative just so that you know um giving the opportunity and being able to be a part of our team um has been uh pretty interesting to watch like um and said we're like you know majority of the time we are like one big family and 
So we're taking care of each other a lot. Um, they're very invested in just wanting to see people succeed and not just indigenous and, and in general having um, majority of our team being um, women. Um, that is something important that, uh, you know, like just being able to share that with um, the communities that we are in and work for. Siobhan, if uh, you could look into the camera and tell other young Indigenous women w about getting into the business of, of working in, in, in the mining industry, what, what would you say? Um, I would say, like, don't be scared to, uh, you know, uh, learn a little bit about it if you're not familiar with it. Like with my, you know, career history, I didn't know anything about mining. Um, the closest uh, mining facility was a five-hour drive uh, in uh, northwestern Ontario. And, you know, it wasn't really anything that I even considered even during high school. And it wasn't until my last year at university that, you know, I you know, was kind of considering something along the lines of you know, joint being in the mining industry. And I will say that that was something that I kind of struggled with because with the, I didn't know, because I didn't know anything about the mining industry. And I thought that, you know, it was still the same as it had been for, you know, a lot, like, you know, 50 years ago where there was no, you know, land reclamation uh, or, or, you know, remediation, that type of stuff wasn't happening back then. And, um, it wasn't really until I started looking into it more and um, realizing that like it could be something that I would be interested in. And uh, so, and even like if, if like in my my instance, like I had to move away for uh, to be able to work in the mining industry. I had to move away from my family. Um, my my reserve is not um, on uh, like a, an area of land that has a mining facility um, operational near it. It's not part of any IBAs. And so I'm the first one of my family working in the mining industry. And, you know, and it took a little bit for my family to, you know, get on board with it, mainly to do with the fact that I go underground every day. So <laughs> that kind of scares them a little bit. But I tell them that, you know, it's engineered, like it's, <laughs> there's support, so worry. Um, but, uh, you know, don't, don't be scared and like, if, just learn a little bit about it. And, you know, I just like, all I did was I went to the mining department and I went to like a professor that I had no, I didn't know about. And he was like, oh, you want to, you're interested in mining. And then just started like giving me all this information. I got like this basically like mining 101 book. And it went from the, you know, uh, you know, uh, getting the ore out of the ground all the way to the processing facilities. And so that's where it kind of started when I was like working was like the process facilities because I did chemical engineering. So it was a little bit like, well, not a little bit, but it is like involved a lot with like processes and stuff like that. And I didn't really think that I could get into mining too much. Um, but, you know, then as I started working, I, I learned so much more and it interested me way, way beyond anything that I could have ever imagined to like, you know, little 14 year old me in Sulaq, Ontario, and <laughs> not knowing anything about mining. Uh, so yeah, just, you know, don't be scared and just try to learn about it if, you, if you'd like. Very good. Um, uh, Taryn, over to you. What advice would you give young Indigenous women who want to work in the mining industry? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is if, if you think you can't, you can. And if you think, no, it's not for me, it, it is. <laughs> just do it. I think just just jump in. Um, the same with Siobhan. In the beginning of my career, I was like, I don't know, can I do this? Or, you know, that, that self-doubt we give ourselves a lot, I think, hinders us. So, I think if I could do something over or look back or tell someone starting out is just just try just just go in full force and have the confidence and it's it's okay to not know things and, and learn on the job it's okay that's I think that's the great part about mining is that there's so many opportunities and a lot of them have longevity of jobs so you have time to learn and, and experience so many of these things so I think there's so many opportunities and I would say just go and do it. <laughs> Just Very try. Good. It's always worth it. Excellent advice. Kimberly, over to you. What would you tell young Indigenous women? Um, so I would just encourage them to go outside their comfort zone and try, like for for me, trying anything once, um, especially if it terrifies me, then I know that it's meant for me kind of thing. 
um, just sharing the stories of my failures because I think it's important as well to, to kind of go through about, you know, just talking about what works um, for me and it might not work for everybody else, but it might give them that little bit of hope that they would um, continue just to go out and try because I mean, if you don't try, then you just don't know and you don't know your limits if you place yourself in a box. And so I always say, you know, go outside the box and think, you know, just that you're, you're fit for the job, you can do it and that um, eventually it will lead you somewhere where you never thought you would be. Um, and I'm a great example of that um, for where sure. I come from and what I'm doing. Well, ladies, I want to, there's 15 minutes left here and I want to leave some time for Q&A. Some of the questions are coming through, but I want to thank you for sharing your heartfelt stories and experiences with our viewers. Um, it, once again, it raises awareness and it, it truly has been a pleasure to speak to you. I, I, can't, I can't tell you enough of that. Um, I hope your stories and comments will inspire other young women to join uh, Women in Mining. And again, it's, it's been amazing. So thank you for that. So now let's uh, let's go over to um, some of the questions that have been coming through, and I know there's some comments as well. So I, I am going to address the first comment because I think maybe one of you ladies might like to take this, but it's just a comment. The issue is the people do understand equal opportunity. We may get hired, and this is a quote, because we are Indigenous women, or, or Indigenous or women, I should say, but we had to also have the equivalent or higher education experience than the rest of the candidates. It is our work ethics that keep us there. Who, who wants to uh, address that? Siobhan, maybe, or? or um... I should say, I totally agree with the comment. I think your, your worth ethic is, is what visibly and people see that. So I know for myself, I'm, I'm constantly like, do I do it on a job or that self-doubt? Because I'm always trying to push myself to, to work hard. And so yeah, I 100% agree with that comment. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah I, I would say I have to agree with that as well. Um, it, but I think also, you know, you could still have those doubts, like even later on, like even when you're like three to four years into your career and they have kept you around because of your work ethic, you know, that self-doubt still kind of creeps in and um, it, it's difficult, to, at least I found, um, to kind of shake that. Um, and I finally, I finally was able to, but <laughs> it did take a while. And I, I should have mentioned that that... Um, comment came in from uh, Carrie Lenowick. So just in case maybe anyone who knows her and likes to um, maybe address that later. Um, also, we've got a comment here from Bo Luang and it says, not a question, but uh, sending support, heart, strength from the stories of the doubt and prejudice and unexpected um, rudeness from colleagues. So there's, there's a cheerleading team for you but uh, um any any comments you want to make to both maybe just no, thank you both that, for like, those comments yeah, yeah like i mean it's, i think it's really great when um especially when you know we like we start to share, share our stories because that might be something that they didn't really think about or like maybe they didn't think it was so like a thing that was happening uh, you know in 2021 when it when it is and it's it's great when you could get you know more allies and stuff like that on um different on, you know on your site on your project and even just in your general life um you know be <laughs> surrounding yourself with people that uh are going towards this like one common goal of you know a, a workplace that maybe it doesn't really matter that we're like you know trying to engage more indigenous women and you know i think that that's yeah something that would be uh, really great um this next question actually is addressed specifically to kimberly and um it's from lana Ing eagle and she's saying um kimberly how would you define an, an inclusive workplace Um, I think more or less like feeling like a family. Um, that's one of the major important parts of the job is um, loving where you work and who you work with. And um, I think that's pretty much what drives me to want to help other women as well, to make them feel welcome, make them feel important. Um, because my team has done that for me. 
Well, there's a second part to that question too, because um, Lana's asking how, how important is inclusion to your success? Um, it's probably, a t it's one of the top priorities for um, my success, because if I didn't have that, I don't think I would be successful. Very good. And, and, and you know, it's kind of a question, I think, to all of you. Is there is any anything you, Taryn or, or Siobhan, want to share specifically about what, what it means to you to have inclusion for your success? I think it's I think it's very critical, exactly what Kimberly said. And uh, when you have a supportive team it means you want to go to work every day and you want to do well for yourself and for your company. You want to represent them positively. So I think that's that's critical. And, and expansion for growth. I, I appreciate when companies encourage internal growth and, and management that encourages your team to develop and do well. Um, I think that's 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 good too. Yeah, I would just build up on that a little bit. Um, like as well as with like, you know, being comfortable with you know your other teammates on you know a, on a project or a site is that. You would feel comfortable going to them about maybe an uncomfortable situation right so you would feel comfortable talking to them and even if they aren't indigenous or even if they're not a woman you're you would feel comfortable going to them and being like this happened to me today and i don't know how to deal with it i don't know how to address it i need help and i have had that already happen in my career where i've had to you know i have gone to like mentors that i have in in hatch and I've asked them, I've like, this happened today to me like today, or this happened yesterday, and I don't know what to do. Um, how do I address this? How do I, you know, talk to this person that is about four levels above me and you know, telling them that what they're saying isn't isn't okay. And I think, you know, it, it may not seem as diverse as it could be, but like I feel like it, like having that inclusion as part of your team is like the first step that I would say that it would be for, you know, having a more uh, like diverse and inclusion uh, 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 team. So that sounds like a, an obstacle that you sort of had to overcome. And is that, um, is, are there other obstacles that you feel like you've had to overcome in your career? I think a lot of it has to, um, you know, it uh, comes from like the, just the comments and stuff like that that I've gotten um, about uh, you know being a like an indigenous woman or even you know people just asking me what are you and so like it's like how do you it's like I'm a person so first of all <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know and I've told some of my co-workers like that I get questions like what are you and they're like, well, why? Like people actually ask you that. And I'm like, yeah. And so, you know, those types are, are the first types of obstacles. I think also just again, like just tying back to a lot of what we've been talking about today has been, you know, not feeling good enough. And um, so if you couple not feeling good enough with people either saying insensitive things around you or to you, um, it really, and if you don't have like someone that you can talk to, it really, it's just a recipe for disaster because you, your your confidence is just going to go straight down the straight down the drain, and you're not going to be able to put that like 110 percent that I know that you know like we, we are capable of doing. Yeah. Darren, yeah. how about yourself? What are some of the obstacles that you faced? Probably mm -hmm. in the beginning of your career. What were some of them? I think definitely echoing what Siobhan that some of those self doubts, some of those comments I've had made me laugh too because I've had those exact comments of who are you or where are you from or where did you come from or or it's where did you grow up so people always wanting to validate like either are you indigenous enough or did you are you raised in the territory enough or just, just enough I feel like there's like just that word alone can be um, suffocating and, and sometimes um, it's not your team that says it. It's a lot of times I've had it's more public, or that, and then it gives you that doubt that you're thinking about it forever. Like, oh, did I make the right choice? Or, you know, right. So some of those um, struggles, I've had, but is is it intimidating? Intimidating having to move away from home to work in a, in a mining industry? Mm. I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I grew up. Uh, it was a, it's about five hours from Winnipeg and four and a half from Thunder Bay, um, and um, it's just my immediate family that uh, that was growing up there. 
um, all my, like my mom was the first one out of her family to uh, move off reserve. And uh, so like, and that even that in itself was like something that was like a little bit challenging to grow up with. But then, you know, couple that with the fact that I decided to go to school in Southern Ontario, which was about like, it was about a 22 hour drive um, from my hometown. And then I started working in Sudbury and, um, and I remember I didn't know anyone there and uh, I was in the Winnipeg airport and I was wondering like, what am I doing? Am I making the right choice? I was so scared. I was talking to my mom and my friends and, uh, you know, I was just really upset at like, I was like, what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? And, you know, they all told me that they were like, just, you know, you do you, like, you're gonna, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna make friends. You're gonna do a great job. Like, you, like, that's just what you do. Like you, you're very personable, like you're gonna be fine. And it was, it was really upsetting though, like finally making that jump. Cause like a lot of my friends either, you know, moved back home or, you know, stayed in like that general area. And I was the first one to kind of just like make that leap to um, move away. And I was really upset about doing it. And then it was, but then like, you know, four and a half years later, um, I got the opportunity to move out to Newfoundland, which, you know, it's halfway across the country. <laughs> so yeah. my mom yeah. didn't take that one too well. I was fine with it, but <laughs> by that time but, you were over moving away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so like I mean it's like it's scary at first, but you know, I jumped at the chance of moving halfway across the country and you know, working in northern Labrador and um and I, I love it. Yeah. Um there is another question here I'd like to address. So Joanna Singleton, she's um, asked, what, what kind of activities and events do each of the panelists participate in to serve as an active role for, the, for a model for others in, our communi in your communities or similar backgrounds to each of them? So maybe a, just a quick answer, because I, I see <laughs> Cassandra's back on here. Um, so maybe over to uh, Kimberly, let's start with you. Just a, a quick answer if you can. What was the question, sorry? Uh, they're, they're looking for what, what what kind of activities and events are you involved in to serve as a role model in your community? Mm. Well, I'm an active um, member of our nation, um, participate in our tribal um, duties, um, and I'm a mother, so I'm always out and about and doing things uh, for the kids and with the kids, and I think um, for me, it's just showing them that, um, yeah, and to be an example is um, I was I was told by my parents that um, if I wanted them to be good at something, then I have to show them the way to do it. So very good. Pretty much. Karen? Yeah, um, same with Kimberly. I'm a, I'm a mother too with my son. So whatever activities he's usually in, I'm, I'm supporting that. Um, I'm also a business owner, part of business owner with my husband. So we're active in that. Local community-wise, I'm recently a board of directors for a company. Um, I'm a member of the Rotary of Smithers. I wish I could participate more in my traditional territory, but I live about nine hours away, and currently the road's washed out. So just the struggles of living in the north is a challenge. So I try to be, but an active member with my with my Indigenous communities. Um, I try to vote in virtual meetings and in any community gathering I can attend, I try to, because I think it's important exactly that, Kimberly, we need to be an example for the next generation of, of youth coming up. So try to be active wherever I can. And Siobhan, 30 seconds or less, just so I can make sure we <laughs> yeah, just so, just sound mean, around her. <laughs> yeah, I don't live in my traditional territory, obviously, I live in uh, St. John's Newfoundland now, but, um, you know, things I have done in the past have been um, like beating workshops and um because i do i beat earrings uh and uh, even just like hosting like you know some of my friends kids over at my place to do bead work and teach them how to bead um it's something that i find at least therapeutic and um it, and then so they can also see that i can still have like a little bit like of an art side but like i'm still doing this you know the sciencey technical uh stuff up at site so like you know you can have like a bit of a balance to that Okay, so one last line. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna read something that Sarah Morris and I think it's Langton, but it's cutting off on on my screen here. But I just want to read this because it, it pretty much summarizes. I'm sure everybody that's watching this today really enjoyed hearing your perspectives of, uh, of the panelists today. So refreshing to hear your stories. All of you demonstrate such such 
humble leadership styles, and we need more Indigenous women like you. So that sums up everything I'm feeling. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed um, interviewing all of you today. Over to you, Cassandra. And, and thank you. And I just want to echo Mary's comments, the appreciation, uh, both direct from myself and on behalf of the CIM. And, and I think on behalf of the mining industry more broadly, because there really aren't a lot of opportunities for us to be visible and be present, uh, both as, as women and, and for yourselves on, on behalf of your communities and your companies. I, I really appreciate the time and, and energy and the honesty you've brought forward for us today. So we, we are at time, um, and if there are any other questions or, or comments in the chat box, I'll make sure that they are uh, shared with our panelists, and there'll be an opportunity for responses at a later date. The next webinar in our series is scheduled for May 5th, and it will be an open event. It'll be continue to be a free event, open to the public, um, hosted as part of the CIM convention. And this will be a panel discussion sharing cross-industry perspectives on Indigenous inclusion. So reaching outside of the mining industry and looking at inclusion and engagement from other perspectives. So I really hope everyone here will be able to join us for that event coming up in, in a few weeks. And, and again, just thank you to the panelists and thank you to our audience. I, I really appreciate your support and I hope everyone has a really enjoyable rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye -bye.